That's okay. Tell me if I got it framed or right. Is that about right? Okay. No, I can move it. Okay. Um, but anyway, we're looking in Acts 2, and we're going to skip over. We're at the part where Peter's going to give his message, on his first message on uh, the day of Pentecost. We're going to skip over the David part. And jump to the end, because this is primarily where I wanted to look anyway. Uh, in verse 36, starting in verse 36, it says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. I love that. He doesn't let them off the hook. So this wasn't a sweet, patch-on-the-back kind of sermon. I could just see Peter leaning over and saying, the one you guys crucified. Um, Now, when they heard this, verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, verse 35, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. That's us. We're the far off crowd that he's referring here to the Gentiles. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So so those who received his word and were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Uh, Main thing I wanted to touch on out of this tonight is this, and that is, what is it that helps us be effective in reaching people? Because we get a glimpse of it in this. Notice, if you read the whole sermon, it wasn't that great of a sermon. Uh, Peter didn't have his three points, uh, didn't have a poem, uh, didn't quote anyone uh, that was popular at that time, no pop culture, didn't refer to any uh, popular songs or anything. Uh, It was just a straight-up reaction sermon to the fact that the people were mocking them for uh, speaking in tongues, which, again, they were just preaching the gospel in the various languages. They were not just speaking in tongues to be speaking in tongues. They were actually conveying the gospel. And and so he does this impromptu uh, sermon in response to that, And in response to the sermon, 3,000 people get saved. Well, when you look at the sermon, it it wasn't that deep of a sermon. So what was it about the sermon that led to that many people getting saved at one time is the question. Because we see something here that I think is a principle that we're going to see throughout Scripture and even applies today. And that is the two ingredients... We, have, we need to have if we want to be effective in reaching people. So what we've got here is a convergence of two things. It's, I don't remember how to spell convergence. It's too late. I'm just going to stop with that. You got a convergence of two things going on here. One is the message. Okay, so with Peter's message, it wasn't that great of a message. It wasn't Billy Graham quality or anything like that, but it was accurate. Okay, so you can have well-crafted messages. Oh, they would call them talks today. Well-crafted talks today that sound good and they have illustrations and they've got quotes, all kinds of things. But the message isn't accurate. 
It's directing people usually to another Jesus rather than the Jesus of the Bible. And the, the other Jesus is usually cultural Jesus. And cultural Jesus depends on your culture. And by culture, I'm, usually it's going to be ethnic culture or socioeconomic culture. So, for example, a, a cultural Jesus, I did this teaching one time years ago, and I came up with, I think, about 10 or 12. I cannot remember what they were, but it was a lot of fun. Um, but a cultural Jesus would be like middle-class Jesus. And so middle-class Jesus gets preached a lot today, and middle-class Jesus is basically a Jesus who uh, shares our values and so if, if he were walking earth today, he'd want to live in the suburbs, uh, drive a new car, uh, work 50 weeks a year, take two weeks vacation. He understands all of that. He understands that your life has to be governed by propriety and keep things in their place. And there's a, a place for everything and everything in its place. And usually spiritual matters end up in a very small place. Because you have to work, which if you ever do the math and t start taking off the hours, you have to work, and then you have to, if you have kids, take them to some activity, keep them entertained every day, and all the sports and everything else. And so when you start doing all that subtraction, taking away time, there's not a whole lot of time left. And so middle class Jesus understands that, and he's good with it. He under, he's just thankful that you give me any attention at all. And so middle-class Jesus, if that's the one that gets preached, uh, is basically all about the American dream. And so, you know, if, you, if you're converted to that Jesus, uh, you're not going to ever hear anything controversial. You're not going to be challenged to change anything except to self-improve so you have a better chance of achieving the American dream. So that's kind of middle class Jesus. Uh, you know, every, every group's got their Jesus. Uh, I, you know, a great way to, if you want to see that, go to churches of different ethnic groups that believe in G that Jesus is part of their religion and look on their windows if they have stained glass and see what Jesus looks like. And I promise you, every one of them's going to have a Jesus that looks like them. And there's sometimes you may look at Jesus and say, I didn't know he looked like that. Well, that's because in their mind, and everybody does this, Jesus is one of us, whoever us is, okay? So you have to be sure the message is accurate. And if it's not, it doesn't matter how good it is, it's still going to miss the mark. So if, if the message is accurate like it was here, then you've got half of it covered. The second part of the equation is timeliness. Okay? So that means this was the right time for Peter to share this message for it to produce maximum impact. Now, if he'd have said, you know, y'all, you guys gather up here next week and I'll do it next week, it wouldn't have worked. That's why it's so important for us to be tuned in to what the Holy Spirit is saying because he'll lead you into situations where it's the right time to do whatever he's telling us to do. And that's when you see the results. Because you can give the right message, but if you do it at the wrong time, it still won't produce anything. Does that make sense? So this was the right time. Why was this the right time? Don't know. But you'll see this timeliness element pops up throughout Scripture where, it, uh, for example, way back in the Old Testament, when God told the children of Israel, it's time to go in to the promised land. And they said no. And so uh, Moses said, well, that's it. You're going to live, in the, you're going to die over here in the wilderness, so get ready. And it said they grieved all night long, they wailed all night long. And the next day they said, okay, we're going in today. And he said, that's a big mistake. You missed your time. So they were 
do, wanted to do the right thing, but at the wrong time. So they were going to get the wrong result. So that's why timeliness is so important. How does that impact us? Like I said a minute ago, God uses all of us to minister to other people. He wants to use us to maybe witness to someone, to maybe speak a word of encouragement to someone. Whatever it is God's using you to do in someone else's life, chances are if we'll do it the way he says to do it, when he says to do it, you'll see the results that if you say, well, I'll get around to it tomorrow, you won't see. There's that timeliness. You know, you'll see that in praying for people especially. If God lays on your heart, go pray for somebody. and You say, yeah, I'm going to get to that. I'll, I'll do it later. And when later comes, it's too late. A fellow was telling me the other day he had been witnessing to a guy. And the guy um, was on his deathbed. And he kept, he called him up and he said, you know, come on, you, I mean, he explained the gospel to him again. He tried to talk him into surrendering his life to Christ. Come on now, don't, don't miss this opportunity. This may be the last opportunity you have. And the guy said, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. I just can't do it. He said, come on now, this may be it. He said, hey, you talked to him for two hours. And the guy said, not tonight. That was on a Sunday night. So he, he called somebody he knew that lived in that town. This was in another town. And he said, would y'all go witness to the guy? And they said, yeah, we'll go witness to the guy. So they went over that next morning to witness to him that Monday morning. And he had told him Sunday night, he said, I'll be up there to see you Tuesday. And he said, I was going to go up there and I was really going to put it on him Tuesday. He died Monday night. And he said, you know, I don't know where he went. He said he talked to the people that went to witness to him, and they said he prayed with them. He said, but I don't know. You see, he missed his time. Now, did he get saved? I don't know. I hope he did. But you you can't just play around with the time part of this. And it's so easy to play with that part of it because we're all busy. And it's real easy to say, well, I'll get to it later. Well, later may be too late. So Peter delivers his message, an accurate message. He does it at the right time. And so what did that result in? Well, that was verse uh, 20, 38, where he, uh, no, verse 37, I'm sorry, where it says they were cut to the heart. That's a phrase that means they were convicted. Okay? So when it's the right message at the right time, You get the right result. Conviction. Not condemnation. Conviction and condemnation are not the same thing. You can talk people into feeling guilty about something, but that doesn't mean that they're convicted about it. It just means you've talked them into feeling guilty about it. And so the the difference also is with conviction, there's a way of dealing with it. There's a solution. With condemnation, there's not. Condemnation, once it sets in, it just hangs around. But with conviction, there's a way to deal with it. So the right message at the right time produce the conviction. And any time that there's conviction, there's going to be the question, what to do now? And what do you do now? You repent. And so what you're going to find in working with people many times, regardless of where, they are, where you think they are spiritually, if God's put it on your heart, I want you to go do such and such or say such and such. If you'll do it, if you'll del- deliver the right message at the right time, it'll have the right effect in their life. But it's not enough to get them there. Take them on. To repentance. And ideally, from repentance to baptism, which is what they did. 
Uh, in that culture, you were not considered a Christian unless you were baptized. So you could respond to all the invitations you wanted, say all the prayers you wanted. They didn't consider it legitimate until you were baptized. And there are some countries that still that way. All right, any questions? I told y'all it wouldn't take long. But I just wanted to encourage you with that because I know we all want to see people's lives change and we want God to use us to help change their lives. So what's going to be the key to this part of it? The key to this part of it, we have got to be tuned in. Tuned in to the Lord. Listening to the Holy Spirit. And I was listening to somebody preaching on praying today and you know, I, I thought, if you don't know what to pray, that's a good indication it's time to pray in your prayer language. And um, I think one reason why a lot of Christians don't pray is because either they don't know how or they don't know what to do, what to say. They don't know what to pray. And if they don't believe there is such a thing as a prayer language, you're kind of left out. So use that prayer language. We all have it. We all have it. And you may think, well, I don't. You do. You got it as a birthday gift when you were born again. And if it helps you, just say banana, banana, banana. <laughs> no, don't do that. But you just say, Lord, I release that prayer language. That's in me. That doesn't mean you're going to get up on Sunday and say, I got a message in tongues. Most people will never do that. Because the Bible says God gave some the gift in to do that. He didn't say he gave everybody, but everybody does get a prayer language. So use it. And if you don't know what to pray, if the Holy Spirit's tugging on you, something's coming up. Something's coming up. All right, what, what's coming up? Let me know. Let me be sensitive. And a lot of times if you'll get tuned in, he'll drop it in your spirit just like that and you'll meet somebody encounter somebody and it, I don't know if y'all have ever sensed this or not but I've it's been wild sometimes to encounter somebody and it's just like a green light clicks on this is it and then you especially if you'll exercise a word of knowledge and God will start telling you stuff about this person you know, you're not trying to embarrass them, but God will give you some insight into their situation that otherwise you wouldn't know. And you can speak to that situation, the truth, at the right time and see things happen. And that's so much better than having the wrong message or having the right message and just ignoring the time factor. And, just, and then you wonder why it doesn't work. Any questions about that? So are we going to do it? Yes. Are we yes. going to do it? We're going to say... Night when we were at the port, I was, we, we were praying. There was so much time, and I kept telling everybody while we were waiting, and I said, look, this is our time to be praying. And we had prayed and prayed and prayed. And the people we were with were believers. And um, then there was a little bit of a break. Michael yesterday came out, and they were talking to all of us. Um, and I just put my arms around Jessica. She goes to Memphis Baptist, and, and I had my arm around the sweet nurse who had come to support her from First Press. And I was done with English. We had prayed for hours. <laughs> Let them talk. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that God has people lined up for us to minister to. And chances are you won't know ahead of time who it is. So you have to be instant in season and out of season and have the right message for the right time. And it'll produce the right results. Yes. We're trying to be ready to be a light to the kids. Mm -hmm. And at night, uh, September's on the fourth. And before they go to bed, I said, Let's pray now. I've been doing this. And the first time, she said, I don't pray. But now, at bedtime, uh, I said, Let's pray. And she says, I started praying. She says, Let me say my. 
Well, that's how it works. That's how to make it work. Because there's a lot of needs out there right now. A lot of fear. A lot of um, loneliness. Despair. And um, somebody's got to speak to it. It's true. True. And girls are a lot bigger than boys. Well. Yeah. So there's a name to add to the list. And what I said, Sunday, I really mean, I think one of our missions is to be a prayer center. And um, so let's pray for a few minutes. If someone, God lays someone on your heart, then I'll close it out. I'll give you a few minutes if you want to pray. Thank you. 